Well, good morning here. Welcome. It is our second Advent, and I'm going to invite you to stand as I read a few verses from Isaiah chapter 9. If you're with us online, I invite you to stand in your living room, not if you're driving, but in your living room. That'd be great. As we enter this season of Advent together this morning, hear these words from Isaiah chapter 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And as we talk about waiting this morning, would you wait on the Lord and anticipate to hear from him in this service and our time together? Amen. Yes, we were waiting with our hope and with our light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Storm was moved for good, for the Lamb 
I conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born And the Spirit lit the flame For this gospel truth take to be our Messiah.
sermon this morning. Uh, we're going to participate in communion together. As we've sung the words, His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love. I wonder if you would begin preparing your hearts by remembering the cross, remembering what Jesus has done for us there, not withholding anything of himself, but laying it all down. So in your own hearts, would you call out to him this morning? Would you bring your hopes and your longings to him in prayer and express trust in him? Let's take a moment here and now and just pray in our own hearts, remembering the, co- the cross and remembering God's goodness to us there.
Father, on this Advent Sunday, we recognize the pull of the season from culture is sometimes more than the pull of the season from you. My prayer for us as a people of God is that there would be spaciousness for us to see again the light that has pierced into our darkness. You have dawned on us, God, and we await the fullness of your kingdom, and we await this Advent, the places that you want to speak to us as your people. Would you help us, Lord, to not enter the season in a place of busyness and anxiousness, but will we come to you daily, to your word and to prayer? to the practices that will tether our hearts to you, the hope of the world, the light of the world. Proclaim you as the one we want to serve this Advent. So together, would we sing this chorus one last time? And I invite you to sing it more as a prayer than anything else. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. One more time. Oh, come, let us adore. We adore him. Oh, come, let us adore. You may have a seat and as you turn your eyes to the screen we want to let you know that sadly Eli Fair passed away yesterday there will be more details to come on his memorial but please keep the Fair family in your prayers as a church now turn your eyes to the screen hey everyone my name is Ryan and here's what you need to know Christmas is fast approaching, and we want to tell you about our Christmas Eve services on Saturday, December 24th. Join us at 2, 4, or 6 p.m. as we celebrate the coming of the King. This is a great space to invite your friends and neighbors to. As we anticipate young families and people from our community coming for our 2 and 4 p.m. service times, we ask that if you're able, please consider attending the 6 p.m. service. We know that Christmas can be a difficult time for anyone who has suffered a loss. It can be a time of sadness and grief instead of hope, love, joy, and peace. The Blue Christmas Tea on December 13th at 1.30 p.m. in the Fireside Room will be a time to journey with you in your loss. Please register online. Take a look at this week's Advent Giveaway recipient, Peace Portal Uganda. that Pastor John was able to go and visit the team in Uganda this past fall for the first time in a few years. And it was so great to hear of and see the fruit of their resilience and commitment to the community. What has remained constant in MPG is the desire to offer education, food, and Christian discipleship to those in their community. In this process, lives are being transformed. So please join us in partnering with the team in MPG Uganda to cover ongoing expenses of education and transformation in the community. 
We invite you to partner with us as we bless the Peace Portal Uganda team with $12,000 to continue this good work that God is calling them into in MPG. You can give online on our website or in person using the donation envelopes found in the seat backs and returning them to the giving boxes at the back of the sanctuary or at the Connect Centers. Please note or choose Advent Giveaway when you give. Over the next few weeks, we will be raising funds to support various local and global partners, and we thank you for making it happen. Finally, we are thrilled to be bringing a team over to Uganda in August of 2023. If you'd like to be a part of a team that engages with our partner church in Uganda and participates in the work they're doing over there, email Pastor John Lefebvre about attending an information night on January 16th. Additionally, you can email him if you'd like to know more about the cost and the rough dates of travel ahead of the info session. And that's all you need to know. Have a good week. play that next video there. Hi everybody. We'll watch one more quick video here. Boy, your kids up slow. You mean your mom doesn't buy your hind? No question she. Wait till you taste it. Ketchup slow. The taste that's worth the wait. That commercial was made in uh, 1979. And I guess it's not worth the wait anymore because those glass bottles are long gone. Even with kids being addicted, kids and adults alike, I guess, being addicted to this red sugary goo, it turns out if we have to wait, we'll find another brand of ketchup to put on our burgers. Glass has been replaced by squeeze bottles because they're faster. We live in pursuit of what Andy Crouch calls easy everything. It's an age of instant gratification. Andy Crouch is a Christian thinker who kind of writes at the intersection of technology and spirituality. And he acknowledges that every time a new piece of technology is developed in pursuit of easy everything, there's a bargain that takes place. That is, we, uh, we receive a benefit, but we also give something up. It costs us something. And we don't often think about what it costs us because we're enjoying all of the benefits. I wonder if one of the things we have lost is anticipation. To wait for something with hope. This morning we're going to explore a little bit what it means that we have lost something of our ability to anticipate. Well, here we are, as a church, in the season of Advent, a season of waiting, a season of anticipation. It's making me wait. Wish I could sing it, but it's making me wait. What are we waiting for? That's a good question. What are you waiting for? Not just your next Uber Eats order or the bubble tea you ordered during the service, Liam? Did you order that one? No, it's at the back, no. (laughs) Not just your next Amazon package to arrive, like, ugh, I had to wait four hours for that package. They call that a Prime membership? Oh my goodness. But at the deepest levels of our person, you know, at our deeper levels, what are we waiting for? Maybe better, what are you hoping for? What are you longing for? Maybe you're hoping for love. It's a good thing to be hoping for. I hope we're all hoping for a deeper experience of love in our lives. Maybe it's for friendship. Maybe you're new to the area. I hope for that too. Welcome here. Maybe it's for work. Work gives us a lot of meaning, you know? It gives us a lot of purpose in life. And without work, we may be longing for somewhere to put our hands or somewhere to put our minds. Maybe we're longing for healing, for peace, 
for care or comfort, for wisdom, for joy. Maybe it's for family or for a family member, for a family member to come home or for someone to know God or to grow your family. Maybe it's for freedom from a thought or a behavior that has gripped us in ways we want to let go. I hope for all of us, we're longing just for a deeper experience of life. Advent comes from a Latin word that means coming. And the coming that it primarily refers to is Jesus' coming, not ketchup. On what the Bible calls the last day, Christ will return. And for those who put their faith in Christ, all of those deep longings that I was just talking about, will be fulfilled. No, we will be perfectly loved. We will be completely at peace in ourselves and with one another. We will be um, full of life. Joy will be the air we breathe. Freedom will reign and will no longer be bound to negative thoughts or behaviors that grip us. Healing will come emotionally and physically. There will be no more sorrow or sighing. No more broken bodies, no more disease, just flourishing. And all because we are in perfect communion with the one who is life and who is love and who is wholeness and who is healing, Jesus, the returning King of all. That is what Advent anticipates. Anticipation. It's making me wait. The coming that is worth the wait. And so Advent looks forward in hope and in faith for a better day. But it also looks back. It looks back at Jesus' first coming. The incarnation. Christmas. The Word made flesh. God becoming human. John 1 says he came to his own and his own people did not recognize him. He came. It's to this twofold coming, past and future, that we look now as we hear from three women this morning. Two in scripture and one here in our present day church family. All three women will give witness to faith-filled, hopeful waiting. Waiting for God to act. Waiting for Him to redeem. Waiting for Him to see them and to sweep them up into a greater hope than they can muster in themselves. Because we know this, waiting doesn't always happen in hope or in faith, does it? In fact, more often waiting happens in discouragement. It happens in defeat. It happens in despair, even. We don't have to wait for a lot these days, but we still have to wait for the most important things, for the deepest things. There are many ways in which we must wait, actually. And it will either be in impatience and anxiety, in frustration and despair, or with God's help, It can be in hope and in faith. Okay, to our three women witnesses this morning. They are going to witness to us faith-filled, hopeful waiting for God to come. I think it's fitting that we're hearing from three women this morning as the Gospel of Luke begins with these women's stories as if to say, take note, though passed over by many, At this time in history, these women have a great deal to teach us. Don't miss their example. The first two witnesses share a family tree. They share an angelic announcement. And they share miraculous pregnancies. Their names are Elizabeth and Mary. And the first witness we'll hear from this morning or focus on is Elizabeth. Read with me as she's introduced alongside her husband, Zechariah, in Luke chapter 1. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, 
There was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So who is she? The text tells us a few things at the outset. Elizabeth is a Jew, which means she belongs to the storied people of God, beginning with Abraham and God's promises to him up to their present day in first century Israel. Second, it tells us she's from a priestly line. She's a daughter of Aaron. She's the Aaron's line where a set-apart people called to mediate relationship between God and Israel, even God and humanity. And they did that through the temple and the sacrificial system at the time. So she's from this priestly line called it to be these special kind of mediators of relationship between God and people. And then it says she was righteous in the sight of God. This is the good kind of righteous. Sometimes I think we think of self-righteous when we hear the word righteous. But she, it says she's righteous. She's genuinely righteous. She, she listens to God and she seeks to please God with her whole life. She aligns herself with God and with his law. And then lastly, and this is really important to the story, it says she has no children. Elizabeth was not able to conceive and she was advanced in years. We need to know that culturally, there's a lot of shame tied to that. Children were seen as a great gift from God, and not being able to have children was often viewed at this time in history as retributive or uh, as if you were doing something wrong. Now, I'm going to briefly recap some of the story, and we're going to pick up on that theme of, of her not being able to conceive and some of what God does for her in the midst of that. So Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, is a priest at the temple, and it's his turn to go into the holy place. They kind of choose one, one priest to go in there at a time, and he goes in to light some incense. And when he does, he encounters an angel there. He's shocked, as you would be, and he's fearful, and the angel says to him, your prayers have been answered. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you are to call him John. And he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will return many people in Israel to their God. He will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And he will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now this is pretty remarkable. Elijah is one of the great prophets of Israel's story. There's Moses and there's Elijah. They're like Alfonso Davies and Jonathan David of Team Canada Soccer, the one-two punch of old, co of old Covenant prophets. I won't go too deep into Team Canada Soccer right now. It's a little emotional for us all, but whew. they say this, your son is going to be like Elijah. He's going to be the next Alfonso Davies because God's spirit will be with him just like he was with Elijah. That's big, especially because Israel hadn't had a prophet for 400 years. It's been really quiet. There's been a huge amount of waiting. And then there's the fact, this is amazing, because there's the fact that this angel is standing in front of Zechariah. And it's not like a little Cupid angel that we sometimes picture. This is Gabriel. He's a warrior angel. And he's standing in front of Zechariah, powerful. And Zechariah's response is not faith-filled, nor is it hopeful. He decides to go with, how will I know these things will take place? My wife and I are very old. His doubts are forward in his mind. Maybe this angel doesn't know that she can't conceive. We've tried a few times, you know. Then there's the fact that it's been a long time since we've had a prophet. Maybe this angel doesn't know the whole situation. Gabriel's not really impressed with Zechariah's response, and you can hear it in Gabriel's response. He says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. 
And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Zechariah goes home. He draws a picture or acts it out somehow. And and eventually Elizabeth becomes pregnant. Something else might have happened in between, but she becomes pregnant. Her recorded response in contrast to her now mute husband is this. The Lord has done this for me. In these days, he has shown his favor and he's taken away my disgrace among the, pe- among the people. Elizabeth shows faith. God has done this and he will continue to do it. She hasn't given birth yet. She's still very old. Geriatric pregnancy in ancient times is not easy. There's still a high probability of complications. It's not what Elizabeth is focused on. She sees God's hand at work, and that is what fills her with faith and with hope. Now, when we hear this story of a righteous woman in Israel, unable to conceive, miraculously becoming pregnant, that is meant to set off some alarm bells for us of Old Testament stories. We shouldn't be able to read this story without recalling some of the faith-filled women of old who are described similarly. Most famously, Sarah, who is the matriarch of Israel, the wife of Abraham. She's described as being barren in her old age, and yet she gives birth to Isaac, through whom the promise of being a blessing to all the families of the earth is carried forward. He's a miracle child, a gift from God. Isaac grows up and marries Rebecca, who's also unable to conceive until she miraculously has twins. Jacob, one of the twins, grows up, marries Rachel, who is also unable to conceive until she miraculously has Joseph and Benjamin. This is repeated almost like a pattern so that we can't miss the point. God is doing this, not humans. This is God's promise and he's committed to bringing it to fulfillment in history. And he will will use the least likely characters, those who can't conceive, old women, old men, so that no one can say it was by human achievement. He gets all the glory. So those women in the early Israelite family tree are important, but likely the most important is the Old Testament woman, Hannah. She's the mother of Samuel. She also can't have kids and is getting older, and she's sad about it. And she's praying, and she's asking God for a child, and she becomes pregnant in her old age with Samuel. The reason I say that this story is most likely uh, the most significant is because it's clearly in the background for Luke. He's he's drawing verbal parallels between Luke chapter 1 and 1 Samuel chapter 1. He's repeating the same language and the same themes. And I think that's important because Samuel, Hannah's son, grows up to be a prophet who anoints David as king. That's his big role. Here in Luke, Elizabeth, the next Hannah, is miraculously giving birth to one who will be a prophet and prepare the way for the Lord, the Messiah, the son of David. And so these parallels are being drawn between Samuel and John the Baptist and their call to prepare the way for Israel's greatest kings. But the parallel first is between Elizabeth and Hannah, and their faith, and their hope in God, even when it seems impossible. And the way that God sees that, and responds to that, and then invites them to play key roles in his great story. And so this this history of some of the great women of old, Sarah, and Rebecca, and Rachel, and Hannah, it doesn't escape Elizabeth. Elizabeth. She knows the history of the people she belongs to and she knows the God who has acted in these ways in the past. 
And so for her, this isn't just the gift of a child. It's certainly that, and I don't want to diminish that. She's waited a long time. She's faced a lot of shame in not being able to have a child at this time in history. And so this gift is very personal. It's very beautiful. But it's also inviting her to have an instrumental, elevated place in the great story of God redeeming humanity. It sets her in line with the matriarchs of old. She's having a miracle child, yes, but the miracle child who is called to prepare the way for the Messiah, who will come in the spirit and power of Elijah as prophesied by Malachi at the end of the Old Covenant. Elizabeth knows the bigger picture. She's full of faith and hope at how God will act through this child and through the one he is preparing the way for. Her faith stands out to us, even as it's set in contrast to her husband's lack of faith. Elizabeth's role in this, I just want to emphasize this, Elizabeth's role in this is not incidental or accidental. God chooses her to give birth to John because she is faith-filled, because she is hoping for God's action in the world in the ways that the prophets have spoken of. That is because she's waiting for it. She's caught up in the story already and so God chooses to further invite her in. I wonder how that might be instructive for us. Are we caught up in God's story and promises of his action in the world and through his church? Or are we caught up in very different stories, especially as Christmas approaches? There's lots of good ones, but what's our ultimate story? What's the one we indwell and live from? Wouldn't we all love to be visited by the living God and invited to play a role in his story unfolding in this time. I think Elizabeth's witness shows us that he is looking for those who are waiting in hope and in faith. Which is similar to our second female witness this morning, Mary, the mother of our Lord. Mary is also caught up in the promises of God to Israel when she is also visited by the same angel. We read, continuing in Luke chapter 1, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Doesn't want us to miss, this is a virgin. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fall, ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. What a message to receive, and what a response to give. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Whatever you say, you are an angel of the Lord. To repeat, Mary is a virgin. 
She's young, likely a teenager. But unlike Zechariah, who wants a sign as further assurance and has his doubts at the forefront, we're old. Mary doesn't think, I'm a virgin. She has hope and faith at the forefront of her mind and heart, despite this being one of the most inconceivable, confounding mysteries of our faith. The incarnation, the virgin birth. John Donne, a poet, verbally depicts some of the mystery of of this moment in his poem, The Annunciation. I'll read it once and then try and slow down and say it again. It says this, Whom thou conceivest, conceived. Yea, thou art now thy maker's maker and thy father's mother. Thou hast light and dark, shuttest in little room, immensity cloistered in thy dear womb. You feel the mystery of it? He's playing with the language of it. Whom thou conceivest, conceived. The one that God thought of, conceived of, is now conceiving God, becoming pregnant with God. He switches the subject. Yea, thou art now thy maker's maker, speaking to Mary. You're your maker's maker. Thy father's mother. Thou hast light in dark and shuttest in little room immensity cloistered in thy dear womb. Profound mystery. That Mary takes in stride and responds to with faith. Mary, like Elizabeth, has been waiting. She's been waiting for the promised Messiah. She's been long swept up in the story of God with humanity and with Israel in particular. And she's favored and she's seen by God as a result. Her faith in him sets her apart for such a time as this. There's not much else that sets her apart. She's poor. She's young. She's female, which at this time was a significant knock against her status. She's unimportant by almost every worldly standard at the time. But God sees all of that and more. He sees her as faith full, hoping in him. And he comes to her and he says, she will be the one to birth and mother the Messiah. In fact, the Son of God. I would contend there's something about the way in which she has waited that has set her apart in God's God's eyes. Hopeful. Faithful. Uh, Just a quick aside. Mary goes down to visit Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth's six months pregnant now. They have this sweet initial interaction. The baby inside Elizabeth leaps for joy at the presence of her Lord. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And Elizabeth's words to Mary are this. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. I kind of love this moment because I picture Mary's walking into Elizabeth's house. And I picture Zechariah still mute maybe sitting in the corner reading something because he's mute because he, he didn't believe. And now his wife is greeting Mary and says, blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. The women are being contrasted with the men of status in this story. And then we get a window into what Mary was waiting for. In fact, in her response to this pregnancy, um, it's called the Magnificat. She, She declares something of what she's been hoping for and some of the ways that her hopes are coming to fruition in this child. And so just briefly, we'll read this. Uh, I'll skip over a couple verses, but it says this. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble, humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but he sent the rich away empty. 
He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Again, I think I've said it, Mary is embedded in this story. She has been waiting for this moment. This is what you have promised to our ancestors, God. She's quoting the covenant promises of old, the blessings of old. She's hearkening back to God's first promise to Abraham. Mary is full of hope, not of herself, not found in the world, but found in God and in his words and in his character and in his actions. That's the sustaining source of her hope. And in a time where the Israelite people are oppressed and ruled over by the Romans, she is so confident that this child will bring bring about the long-awaited reversal, the revolution that they have been waiting for. Mary sees revolution in this child that is being born, uh, is, is growing inside her womb. God's kingdom is coming, and Mary, above and before anyone else in the world, believes it, hopes in it, sees it, experiences it in this pregnancy, and declares it in her Magnificat. She has been waiting for this day, and she finds herself smack dab in the middle of it. It's an incomparable situation. I don't know what to compare it to, but I'll I'll make a half uh, meager attempt. So I, I think of... Jack Stevenson is, is a kid that attends our church here. He's awesome. He's a very good soccer player. And he loves soccer. He's been watching World Cup a lot on the TV these days. And so I want you to imagine that John Herdman, coach of Team Canada, shows up at Jack's door next week. He's 12 years old. John Herdman, coach, shows up at, John's, at Jack's door and says, Jack, we need you. Our team didn't fare so well this year. We're bringing you in. And Jack's like, what? Like, I'm 12 years old. Are you kidding me? And he's like, no, it's you. We need you. You're the player we've been waiting for. And Jack's like, all right, I'm in. He jumps on the team. He starts training with Team Canada. 2026 comes around, World Cup in Vancouver. Is it in Vancouver? In Canada somewhere. And uh, Jack leads Team Canada to World Cup glory. Whoo! Like, what a moment, you know? He's, he's dreamt, he's watched this on TV, he's seen it from afar, he's embedded himself in the story of soccer in Canada, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere seemingly, he finds himself smack dab in the middle of it. It's an amazing reality. Now, obviously, there are differences between that and what's going on here, but let me say this. Neither Elizabeth nor Mary are the main characters in this story. God is, he's the one who is acting faithfully in the way he has long promised. He's coming to redeem his people, and in fact, he's redeeming the whole world. He's coming to forgive sin. He's coming to act on the world's behalf through two miracle babies, John and Jesus, and two women who believed and were full of hope in God and in his promises. This is the coming that the world has been waiting for. And Elizabeth and Mary are examples to us of what faithful and hopeful waiting can look like. And how those who wait on the Lord in hope will find themselves further invited into his work and story in the present. Our third witness this morning is named Aaron. And she was willing to film part of her story for us. Erin is a part of our church family, and in the last year and a half, she has walked a road that we would never wish on anyone, let alone a young mother. But listen for her witness now of God's advent to her, God's coming to her, empowering her waiting to be faith-filled and in hope. Erin I uh, wrote Erin this week and asked her kind of why she chose to share this. She said she chose to share her story with us so that we might have more reason to hope in God in the midst of whatever we are walking through to do today. Uh, let's, let's hear Erin's story together.
family's favorite thing about the Advent season is just the anticipation of what is to come. We have our Advent calendars of chocolate that the kids get every day. And um, we love coming to church in December and experiencing that with the family here. In March of 2021, I was um, bringing my kids home from school on the first day of spring break and I had a seizure, which I didn't know was a seizure at the time. And then two days later, I had another seizure, again, not knowing that it was a seizure. So my husband ended up taking me to the hospital and ensued was uh, a CAT scan and an MRI. And then an appointment with a neurologist stating that we had a brain tumor. We were waiting to see specialists, but it was taking too long and my symptoms kept getting worse and worse. So one day my husband took me to the hospital and dropped me off there. It was during COVID, so he wasn't allowed to come in. So I got dropped off and I ended up having an emergency craniotomy. And um, they removed as much of the tumor as they could. And then I was in the hospital for about a week and I got to come home after that. And I was given 12 to 18 months to live. It was shocking. It took a long time for it to really sink in. It was just a really hard, hard year and a half because I got so sick. They were pretty strict on my timeline and they were pretty strict on letting me know that that's all I should hope for and not more than that. So I had a experience in the hospital before my surgery where um, I felt like I met with God. I had an experience that was surreal and only could be described as a meeting with God. And a lot of people been, had been praying for me to experience peace and I had a moment where I felt like I was in His presence and in His presence only and I had just this huge wave of peace pass over me to the point where I went into my surgery and feeling no fear. So I think that happened for me so that my faith could be strengthened and so that as I went through this hardest time in my life, I had more to lean on than just myself. For me, the hope kept coming, kept coming, kept coming, and kept coming until finally this last year, we got better news. I've had a series of MRIs which kept showing the tumor was shrinking and stable. And then finally we had an MRI that showed NED, which stands for no evidence of disease. So right now my tumor is gone and they've given me three to five years to live. After so long of counting down sort of to 10 months, eight months, six months, to have all of a sudden three to five years in front of you seems like a lifetime. I have three young kids. When this all started, they were three, five, and seven. So my littlest one was very young, and I was worried that he wouldn't remember me. So more time means more memories that we can create together. We know that there were so many people that had prayed for me for so long, diligently, every day for that news to come. And we see it fulfilled finally. And um, we're just so thankful and grateful. I was able to go through this with God at my side instead of alone. And I was lucky enough to have that experience in the hospital that changed my perspective on everything and made it so that I could walk through this hand in hand with God instead of walk through this fighting against Him. Heart-wrenching, but not hopeless. Thank you for sharing that with us, Erin. Erin uh, was hoping to be here with us this morning with her family, uh, but her kids are pretty sick, and so I think they're watching from home. Hmm. Don't have to walk through it alone. I love, I love those words. I love her testimony to us. I love her witness to us. Faith-filled, hoping in God in the midst of waiting. 
Uh, let's, as a church family, continue to pray for Aaron and for her husband, Demir, and their kids. They have three kids. Uh, Lord, would you continue to have mercy on them? Uh, three women this morning, three witnesses, beckoning us to wait on God in faith, to have hope in God when our situation is calling for us to give up. He has not abandoned us. He has not abandoned this broken world. He comes to those who wait on him. May we learn from the example of these women, Elizabeth, Mary, Aaron. May we root ourselves in God's story and hold firm to the promises he gives us of his coming now and in the future. And may we do so in faith and in hope. One of the ways that Jesus gave us to wait in hope and in faith is that of communion. Communion is for the in-between time. It lets us look back at what Christ has done for us, the ways in which his kingdom has already come, and it points us forward to the day when he will come again. And so we're going to... Take our communion cups now, and we're going to take a few moments to remember what Christ has done at his first coming and to anticipate what he will do at his second coming. Thanks. So I want to ask you some of these questions that we've been asking in the midst of this sermon. Uh, What is hopeful and faithful waiting look like for you? What are you waiting for God to do? How are you waiting for him to act in your own life, in your family's life, in, in, in the experience of the world? As we come to communion, uh, Jesus took these ordinary things, bread and wine, and he invested them with, with great meaning when on the night that he was betrayed, he said, this is my body. This is the new covenant in my blood. Take these in remembrance of me. We call to mind some of the brokenness that that we feel in our own selves and in our world around us. And just before we take the bread together, again, I would invite you to express your faith in Christ in light of what he has done at the cross and in light of what he promises to, to do at his second coming. Would you take a moment and just pray and then we'll read together from 1 Corinthians 11 and take the bread and and the juice together. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
I'm going to call up the Anderson family to uh, read some scripture for us and to light our Advent candle. And as they come up, I'm just going to pray for us. Jesus, you are the fulfillment of all of our deepest longings. You said that you are the bread of life. You are the, our, our, our most basic need for life. And so this morning, we say that you are good. We thank you for your cross. We thank you that you, your body was broken and your blood was spilled out. That you might express your love for us and that you might make a way back for us in all of our brokenness to know life in you and relationship with you now and forevermore. In all the ways that we are waiting, Lord, we pray that you would come to us, that you would presence yourself with us and that you would transform our waiting to be in hope and in faith. Whether we have to wait a short season or a long season, we say that we trust you, that you are good, and that we are yours. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. For unto us a child is born, to us a son will be given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. When she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth, Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting. The baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel. Remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Oh 
His love is love, and His gospel is peace. Chains shall He break, for the slave is our God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to let you guys know that uh, there's space to hang out and to enjoy a coffee in the cafe and foyer area here. We actually have some live music, which is fun. Uh, some upcoming piano students are playing out in the foyer. We'd love if you hung around and listened and enjoyed each other's company. Bless you this week. Guys.